I'm going to briefly introduce the team, what we do, and what we do working as RSEs, which is an acronym you'll see coming up a lot for research software engineers, um, inside the library, and what we do to support the work of RSEs outside the library. And so research computing at St Andrews, a bit of history. It started over 10 years ago. I've asked around, tried to find an actual date, and it's lost in the midst of time. Um, as uh, the Arts and Humanities uh, Computing Service. And it was really in research computing, and the uh, remit widened to all researchers in 2012. Um, I joined the team in the summer of 2014. And then in 2015, we moved from where we had been with the IT services to the new digital research division of uh, the library. This is a small team. Um, the standard is quite bijou in lots of ways. And, uh, uh, but three, uh, what we are officially applications developers. Um, but as a research software engineer, is growing, is growing in acceptance as a term to be used to describe those people whose contribution to research, uh, whether it's an essential service or um, in an academic context, are, um, whose, own, whose primary contribution to research is the development of software. And we report to the senior librarian, Digital Humanities and Research Computing. And there's me and Swithin, who are two of the developers, and analysis are is the senior librarian. And just a bit of context into the digital research division. Um, we have open access teams, research data management, research systems are primarily uh, concerned with uh, our pure instance, and the digital humanities service and the research computing team. So research computing say, supports research in two principal ways. As a development resource available to researchers across the university and by supporting research engineering across the university. And I'm going to talk about the first one first. And so to start with, we'll assist with um, funding applications. Um, and this could be as simple as advising academics on the appropriate technologies they want to be using um, in their research projects uh, and working. With, you know, what, what they need to take into consideration working within the Andrews, St Andrews IT context. But ideally what we really want is to be specifying software development to be carried out during the project <coughs> and getting us costed into the, into the funding applications. And we also do a lot of work for unfunded projects, which, I mean, helping PhD students or pilot projects, but um, obviously funded <coughs> work needs to take priority. And then when we're actually developing sort of develop the uh, development work, the most common kind of support provider, even if we're doing something more complex, is we'll simply provide the project website. We've got our own hosting platform. Um, uh, yeah, we generally, we generally use a WordPress for, for that. We have, um, I know this is, a, this is a library conference, of repositories has, may have specific context. I'm using it in a rather general mm -hmm. sense here. Um, we have uh, an instance of Islandora, which is a, uh, a repository stack based on the, the Fedora repository software and the Drupal content management system. And we use that as a back end for a number of, uh, a, a number of uh, web applications, uh, both within the library and outside. And the image database is a long-standing application that was developed in-house um, over 10 years ago, again, which is <coughs> in which images are described using the v uh, Visual Resource Association metadata schema. And it's used a lot to support teaching and art history in particular. And again, as sort of as the back end for a number of uh, research project websites. Um, and then we do the fun stuff, I guess. Uh, the, so the, the, the custom applications in these is just uh, a, a brief, is, these are the, the technologies we use which happen to have colorful icons which work <laughs> on a slide. Um, but typically the kind of stuff we do, and in principle we would be, be doing almost anything, but uh, lots of databases work with TEI, indexing documents, and say generally this is uh, the outputs are, are web applications. And I'll run through some examples. <coughs> so we're working with uh, Dr. Eileen Fife on the publication of the philosophical uh, transactions. So, uh, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society is the, the longest still running, uh, longest running still active uh, uh, scholarly publication. Um, so it's, say, 350 years was to 2012. Um, uh, so we have a virtual registry of papers, which we've got a lot of data from um, the, the Royal Society about all the, all the articles ever published 
in the uh, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society and the proceedings of the Royal Society, and they're all in this database. They've all got DOIs, and um, the research team uh, are going through expanding on those with details of the publication process. So, um, dates articles were received, when they were read to the committees, when the, uh, the refereeing process, and then they're also putting in all the information which isn't in that initial set um, about papers which never made it to publication for uh, whatever reason. And so we set up this database um, for Alien Hunter team and we have um, developed the interfaces that the researchers are working with to, to input the data. And we've also done a bit of work to um, augment, to improve the data. So I mean, just recently I was grabbing stuff from uh, virtual international authority files about gender information about the various people in the database and, and sucking that in. Um, which is very it was interesting. We used to sit outside the library, sit outside the uh, cataloging team in the library, and chatting with them. But versions of national authority files there. There's certainly synergies here. Um, and then the key fact generator is sort of what will be the initial public-facing part of this, which is drawing on this data and uh, pulling in other economic data that the, the Royal Society has provided about the various costs and so on that are involved in public in in the, the publication of. of of the journals and um, and displaying that to users, pulling it together and synthesizing it in a in a digestible form. Um, so the Islamization of Anatolia is another one, which is a um, my colleagues was working on this, and I I can't come um, claim to know a whole lot about the uh, the history of Anatolia, but um, apparently there is a uh, an extensive body of evidence uh, about the. Uh, Islamization of Anatolia in the Middle Ages, which hasn't been studied, and we've built an index, a uh, searchable index of this evidence characterized in, in various ways, um, which can be searched. And <coughs> Arab cult, uh, cultural semantics in transition, which is, um, again, the pivotal role of, of language consciousness in, in the history of Arab culture. I, I can just about begin to understand that sentence, but that's what the description of the project is. Um, but this, this interface here, you, you can select a, a, a route from the, le the left-hand side and you're shown the, the corresponding lemata, and you pick one of those to see a sense, and then you can see that in context in the corpus of po from an example from the corpus of poetry, which is used to construct a database. And then you can click through three other words in the lines of the poem and so, and so forth. Um, so this work has been a core function of the team since before moving to the library. This is what we were doing when we were in IT services. But it's not difficult to think about it in sort of library terms. So we're enabling researchers to identify and address new questions. There's a significant research data management component to all this. And we're facilitating the collaboration and facilitating collaboration and the dissemination of research. And I'm not a librarian. These sound like quite library things to me. Um, and it, the relationship with academics, I think it was something we've been striving for even before moving to the library, but it has developed. Um, there is more of a conversation, there's more work, working in partnership, there's less simply the demand of the services than might, when there might have been when we were in um, IT services. And the other development work we're doing is for actually library applications for the digital humanities service. And I'll run through these very quickly, um, but the the digital collections is exposing is using the Alandora platform to expose uh, content from our, our special collections, stuff which is either unique to or of particular relevance to St Andrews. Uh, the biographical register holds details of St Andrews alumni, officers, and graduates from uh, 1747 to 1897, and that's drawn from a number of sources in special collections. And we set up recently set up a transcription platform, actually for when an intern is coming in, so set up quite quickly uh, to facilitate the transcription of material from special collections. And we're potentially looking at. Uh, building on this for a, as a crowdsourcing platform. That's what we do as developers. And then what do we do to support research engineering across, research software engineering across the university? Um, and this comes from, we just, we realized it's, it's obvious, um, but nobody had really been thinking about it before, but we aren't the only RSEs at the university. Uh, essentially, at least, there was no sense of who else was developing software for research, what kind of work they're doing, how they're doing it, and how well supported they are. There was very little, I mean, we knew even from when we were in IT services, and we continue to work closely with IT services, that there isn't 
there aren't really central services geared to towards helping uh, developers you know, across the university. So I'm going to step outside just to, to think of it, because these aren't original questions, as I say. Um, Torsten mentioned the uh, Software, Sustainability, Software Sustainability Institute yesterday, um, supporting, <coughs> which supports the UK's research software community. And um, as Torsten mentioned, uh, yesterday, as uh, 7 out of uh, 10, I think, is, was the figure that in that uh, post from Simon Hedrick, uh, 7 out of 10 researchers um, rely on software for their research. So, I mean, there are these external things going on supporting this work. And then spun out of that is the Research um, Software Engineers Association. So if the, if, uh, the Software Sustainability Institute is about um, making sure that software is as good as possible, RSC is about, the RSC Association is about the people, um, making sure that they're properly recognised um, for the work that they do. And then finally, this mentioned Software Carpentry, which is, this has been around for coming up in 20 years. Like, it's out of North America in uh, the first instance, but teaching researchers the computing skills that they need to get more done in less time and with less pain, in their words. Um, so say it's been around for nearly 20 years. So these are not entirely new questions, um, or new issues. So what do we do? Well, it started by putting something up on our library blog. And um, Stan is quite a small place. These are, these are big numbers, believe it or not. Um, for something on the library, and that's I wouldn't. I wrote the blog post, and I won't, but I won't claim credit for, too much credit for that. It was we did go to, go out of our way to share it, make sure it got in front of people. Um, so we got yeah, there are so we just use just to test the waters, get a sense that there were people interested in this sort of thing. So we had fifty people coming back saying yes, we do something like this, and we set up a mailing list at the moment. We've got about seventy five subscribers um, on that. And then in June of last year, we had. A launch event for what we're calling the Research Computing Network. Um, we had about 30 people there. And the, the, several issues raised. Um, and the first one was available, availability of appropriate version control systems. I want to try and avoid getting into too detailed a conversation about uh, the nature of virtual contr version control systems, but um, they are quite crucial for making sure that software is being developed in an appropriate manner. And, and, the, and the lack of training, especially for, as you expect, PGRs and early career researchers. So then, as part of the uh, JISC Research Data Shared Service uh, pilot, which we're involved in, was a research data management survey uh, conducted um, last summer, and it was sent out to 2,000 research staff and students. And we have 300 responses covering every school. And you'll not be able to read that, but that's just to show those segments are all um, the different uh, schools at, at the university. So the big ones there are uh, chemistry, biology, and physics, uh, medicine, and mathematics. But We've got, we've got responses from every school that's in the university. And we managed to get a couple of questions about software tacked onto the end of it for, for our purposes. So we asked, this is an intentionally broad question, um, not quite as broad as, uh, as you know, do you, do you rely on software for research, but do you, are you actively involved with it? As intended, lots of these people won't, well, we've suspected lots of people would not characterize themselves as software developers and would be reluctant to think of themselves in those terms. But they do do work uh, which could be characterized like that. And 41% of the people who responded do this kind of stuff. I wouldn't claim that's representative of the total population. We, I mean, I mentioned the research computing mailing list and the, the survey was promoted through that and so on. So, it, but. Regardless, there's certainly a significant number of people who are doing something, things which could, broadly speaking, be characterised as um, software development as part of their contribution to research. <coughs> and the other, the other questions we asked was about whether they use a code repository version control system. And this is interesting as, as and of itself. As I said, it had come up previously about uh, the lack of availability of suitable systems, but. It's also useful as a proxy um, for whether or not people are engaged in good practice in developing their software. Are they developing software in a sustainable manner, which would allow us to, which would allow people to, which would allow eventually the library to do the sort of things that uh, Torsten was talking about yesterday about uh, ingest, bringing in and preserving uh, software um, for uh, research reproducibility. 
And only 35 people said yes. Only, so that's only 28% of those 124 people who self-identified as software developers, which isn't, which you know, we would like to be higher. Um, so there are clear needs there. And we had a follow-up survey at the end of last year. And we can always mean this was more targeted, sent about 100 people from that pre who sit to give us permission in the previous survey that we could follow up with them, and also sent to the mailing list. And we had 29 responses from that. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the results from that, but I will say on version control, we established that github.com, which is um, a big free, um, a big uh, commercial hosting platform for uh, Git, rep uh, Git repositories for managing uh, managing software is good enough for most people most of the time, particularly because anybody can have as many public repositories as they want on GitHub. But if you're an academic, you uh, send off a request and you can get, um, for free, you can have private repositories. So in that context, GitHub.com is good enough for most people most of the time, but there are some requirements around access controls. If you've got something on GitHub.com and you want to give access to the new member of your, <coughs> a new member of staff, you need to do that manually. There's no Tie it, you can't tie it to the organizational structures at your institution, for example, through LDAP or any other mechanism. Um, and also GitHub, I say it's a commercial third party, it's servers in the United States. Um, there are going to be cases, particularly um, in the case of software, it's more likely to be where there are commercial sensitivities uh, rather than uh, you know, personal data. But um, well, that, having, it, having those things on a third party server in the US is not necessarily going to be appropriate. So we're working on, I'm working on a project proposal to get such a system in place and um, the procedures are such that may take a little bit of time but we'll, uh, we're going to be working through that and I'm sure there'll be more requirements gathering as part of that. And then on training, 45% um, of the respondents to our survey were self-taught or learned on the job with regard to software developments or programming. Um, and we had details of the software carpentry lessons and, and, and we had a lot of interest from the people who responded. So we've been working with uh, KPOD, our professional, develop, uh, professional development service, um, and with Alex Konovlov, who is a, uh, a fellow in um, computer science and he is a certified software carpentry instructor. If you want to call your workshop software carpentry, you need to have a um, certified instructor in place. And we're going to be running two uh, software carpentry workshops this semester. In fact, uh, this time two weeks, I'll be helping out at the, uh, on the second day of the first one. And the plan then is to offer more of these on an ongoing basis. Um, so I haven't quite worked out the frequency, but uh, it could be as, you know, on the basis of, say, one a semester. And then we're developing, I mean, there's no, say, there's no central resources in these things. So we're developing guidance on, on good practice for RSEs. I think good practice rather than best practice in particular, because sometimes talking about best practice gets in the way of the good practice. Um, but uh, if, if the RSEs are engaging in good practice, we can make their software better, which can make, which will make uh, research more reproducible. It can allow to de demonstrate impact. If you're sharing software, if you develop um, uh, R, uh, an R um, script and it's an R package and it's made available on CRAN or uh, a Python script and it's made a Python library and it's made available, available on PyPy. There's a tool called Depsy which you can get which will mine papers for references to your software. And, uh, and look at where that software is being used in other repositories in GitHub and allow you to demonstrate the impact of this work you've done. And uh, yeah, and, and in the long term, you could, engaging in good practice should save effort. And we're just started to develop this openly on GitHub, seeking contributions. It's mostly been me writing stuff at the moment. Um, but we're, we're doing it openly and inviting others to, to contribute. Um, so none of, we weren't doing any of this before moving to the library. Um, and there wasn't really an appetite for it um, before we came to the library. So, um, but it fits. To my mind, it fits in a continuum on, of open research support. So we're moving from open access through research data management and then to research software engineering. Because you need the software. If you've got, you can have your data well managed, well preserved, but if you don't have the software that was used to process that data, 
can you reproduce the experiment? And it also complements the support that's provided by the Digital Humanities Service uh, within our division. And so that's slightly over the 20 minutes, but uh, that's, <coughs> uh, that's what we do. We are research software engineering engineers in the library working with academics to develop what they need and supporting RSEs across the university to develop their own solutions. <coughs> and uh, thank you.